Our Old Testament reading this morning comes from the book of Malachi, chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. If you would like to follow along, you can find this text on pages 889 and 890, or page 838 in your pew Bible. The coming messenger. See, I am sending my messenger to prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, indeed he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming, and who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he will purify the descendants of Levi and refine them like gold and silver until they present offerings to the Lord in righteousness. Then the offerings of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord as in the days of old and as in the former years. This is the word of God. The next scripture reading comes from Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 15, verses 4 through 13. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, so that by steadfastness and by the encouragement of the scriptures we might have hope. May the God of steadfastness and encouragement grant you to live in harmony with one another in accordance with Christ Jesus, so that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. I welcome one another, therefore, just as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. For I tell you that Christ has become a servant of the circumcised on behalf of the truth of God in order that he might confirm the promises given to the patriarchs, and in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy, as it is written. Therefore I will confess you among the Gentiles and sing praises to your name. And again he says, Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles. And let all the peoples praise him. And again Isaiah says, the root of Jesse shall come, the one who rises to rule the Gentiles. In him the Gentile shall hope. And may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. For this is the word of the Lord. And thanks be to God. And so we all know the inevitable, inevitable questions coming this time of year. Our parents, our children, our spouses, or friends will at some point ask, what would you like for Christmas? Then we're tasked with the burden of finding an actual answer. Or perhaps we already have an answer prepared to give out ahead of time. Either way, having to give an answer or having to come up with one can at times be a daunting task and can feel overwhelming, pressurized, and frankly can sometimes even feel a little awkward. How do we know what we want? If we find we are content with what we have, does this maybe then mess with our contentment? Additionally, amid the extremely wide spectrum of possibilities, how do we factor in cost? Do we offer up a cost range of potential gifts or provide a response for an item under $10 to reduce the gifter's financial responsibility? Or do we provide more expensive options just to give them more choices? Man, all of this thinking about it is just even stressing me out now. Either way, there are some things that simply money cannot buy, no matter how much we may desire them or want them. But specifically speaking, there are two of these kinds of items found within today's New Testament passage. At first, we begin with hope. Paul's letter to the Romans opens with a certain reminder and allusion to the Old Testament scriptures. Explicitly stated is one of these two items from this sermon that makes it difficult for money to purchase. 
The underlying theme is that of hope. Paul cites God's qualities of steadfastness and encouragement as two reasons to have and to hang on to that hope. He's referring not to some generalized emotion that ignores reality and insists that everything will turn out fine, but to a core kind of trust that relies on the faithfulness of God and enables us to be faithful no matter how dire our situation might be. In addition, Paul references the well-known Old Testament root of Jesse that shall come up and provide a hope to all. You see, hope's essential to have in life. And in fact, there are a plethora of accounts of criminals in prison, the captured soldiers of our armed forces overseas, and even the victims of kidnappings. And while all of these situations and scenarios are grim and disturbing and disheartening, a majority of them share one common thread. The victims, the prisoners, and the captured all will continue to persevere, to carry on and to fight each day for survival based upon one major premise, that hope exists. If one does not have hope, more often than not, they cease to fight or carry on, and they cease to persevere. There has to be some form of hope of still existing for their own sanity and survival. They have to hope that one day they will be rescued. They have to hope that one day they will be reunited with long-lost friends or family. They have to have a hope that one day they will be out of the darkness in which they currently reside. That there's no family for them to aspire to see one day or again in life, or no chance of being rescued, or way to escape their current situation, and then their hope kind of dwindles. And their optimism for escape or freedom may shrink, and the darkness around them just continues to grow. According to Joanna M. Adams, retired pastor of a Morningside Presbyterian Church in Atlanta, Georgia, but we must also understand more about the hope in which Paul writes. You see, his hope is not a giant pie in the sky type of optimism. And neither is it a cheery denial of the painful realities of life and death and justice and suffering. But Paul has wagered his life on a hope that is grounded in the promises of God and looks forward to the reality and the gospel and the witness of Jesus Christ. A hope is that undaunted force that comes from the Holy Spirit, the getting into our human spirits and drawing us beyond the darkness of today and toward the light of tomorrow. And so encouraged by the marvelous things God has already done, we abide in the hope for what has not yet come but will surely be. So today's candle that we lit was the one for peace. Uh, perhaps some forms of peace can be purchased with enough financial capital. Yet that too may be temporary, at least until the river of funds ceases to flow. But certainly harmony cannot be bought. That is unless, of course, you're paying a top acapella choir to come in and sing. Uh, all just corny joking aside, though, true harmony cannot be purchased. And nor can it be made or constructed with human hands. It's a state of being that requires attentiveness and effort on the account of all involved and all that are seeking to establish said harmony. So it is with established harmony in which Paul's next prayer is that God gives the Romans harmony with one another in accordance with Jesus Christ. But what's the point of such harmony? It is not peace for the sake of peace, but so that together you with one voice glorify God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. See, our world has forgotten that we human creatures exist, and not for the fulfillment of ourselves, but for the glory of God. I said so the text goes on to encourage believers to welcome one another, just as Christ has welcomed you. And whom did Christ not welcome? The children, the outcasts, the foreigners were all his people, the sheep of his pasture. 
I see all of those people were welcomed by Christ when they typically were not welcomed by those in society. And so this type of harmony and hospitality almost makes us feel as if we're watching a Hallmark Christmas movie. Now speaking of which, this time of year is chock full uh, with those Christmas movies. And I have a good friend of mine whose name also happens ironically to be Paul, uh, who has a theory that there are only two types of core Christmas movies. And there's two plots. Uh, so these two primary plots are repeated consistently, no matter how they're packaged, rearranged, or strict, scripted or structured, or how they're filmed. Uh, so the first type of theme is a you don't know what you have plot. Uh, for example, think of movies like National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation, where Clark Griswold's so focused on that bonus check that he forgets how special his family is. Or the movie It's a Wonderful Wife, or maybe even Home Alone. And now in, in It's a Wonderful Wife, the movie stars small town man George Bailey of Bedford Falls, whose life seems so desperate that he contemplates suicide. A quick side note, I am going to spoil the ending of this movie, uh, but if you have not seen it already, it's been out for 70 years, so that's your fault, I'm sorry. <laughs> so George barely standing there, uh, frustrated with his life, an inability to escape this small town. He's standing on a bridge, getting ready to jump. Well, as he's preparing to jump, wouldn't you know it, but his guardian angel comes to his side. Uh, George then is shown a light, what his life would be like uh, for those around him if he had never been born. Uh, sure enough, he then has a change of heart and realizes just how many blessings he has and how many different people he has touched in his own life. He had given others hope. And now he realized a hope in himself brought to him courtesy of his guardian angel. Uh, so the second type of Christmas plot is, you don't know what you're missing. Uh, so the premise of these stories is along the lines of A Christmas Carol, or maybe even the Santa Claus movies with Tim Allen. I'm sure we're all at least familiar with one of these two stories. Uh, but in A Christmas Carol, Ebenezer Scrooge is paid a visit by his Christmas past a Christmas present and ghost of Christmas future. But then he's taken by the house of his clerk, Bob Pratchett, of who, who he overworks and underpays. And he finds the harmony of his entire family, including their very special tiny tin. After that, we know that Scrooge has a change of heart. He realizes what he was missing, and now he has more harmony in his life than ever before. So a good majority of the time, these certain types of stories can be dressed up and reformatted, but 90% of the time, on a deeper level, they'll always carry these two main plots, or at least some little variants of them. That being said, I feel that hope and harmony also fall into these categories. With hope, often we're not aware of what we truly had or could appreciate until it was gone. I have seen this many times in my own life. Right every Christmas and Advent season, I think back to my three grandparents that have died and gone on to be with God. I now more than ever realize how special they made this time of year with their presence. And that's a C-E, not a T-S, just so you don't think I'm a vain guy. And their involvement's in my own life. But with harmony, a lot of people truly do not know the joy happiness they are missing that stems from harmony. A perfect example of this is Ebenezer Scrooge himself in A Christmas Carol. I mean, instead of being grouchy, grumpy, frugal, and alone all the time, where one might find it challenging to experience harmony, let alone the fact that his endless supply of money could not purchase it, he is eventually exposed to a family that has less money but it has much more harmony within their relationships to one another. So that harmony that he witnesses and experiences firsthand leads to a change of his character, his actions, and his seemingly unchangeable heart. 
And so as we continue to journey through this Advent and upcoming Christmas season, we must remain aware of the message and encouragement that Paul, the epistle writer, not my friend, has given us today. That we remain hopeful. As in the hope we have been given in Jesus Christ and the assurance of our salvation should be enough to drag us through the inevitable darkness. The harmony we can create with one another is worth that time and effort that we put into it. We need to realize the blessings that we've been given in life and appreciate what we have. And therefore, during this hectic Advent and Christmas season, I try to hang on to and share two things that others cannot purchase for themselves or other people, hope and harmony. Attempt to see what it is that you have without having to be confronted by your own guardian angel. But try realizing how harmonious your life and your relationships are, can, and should be. A try being that beacon of hope for others by participating in the many events here at church or throughout charitable ministries in town. But if you find a distinct lack of harmony somewhere, a try to inject it uh, through sharing more, appreciating more, and wanting less. So that even if you're posed with the question, what would you like for Christmas? Uh, don't be afraid to break out in song and respond by saying, all I want for Christmas is you. Amen. <laughs>